Let me quickly go to the loo. I will be right back. Okay, where are we in our text? Is David Silva on today? No. No, David, I need to call him. We are on verse 100. Verse 100. Will you help us out, please? Of course. Urvoktasya hilabtaye Tascha sarve sadakaryam Nidityasana mevatu. For the attainment of the aforesaid liberation, I shall now expand, expound the 15 steps with the help of which one has to practice the profound meditation at all times. 
So these 15 sets, steps are directly taken from Yoga Sutra. He doesn't uh, divide them into eight, the Ashtanga Yoga. He divides them into 15, but they are directly taken from Yoga Sutra. And here he says these are steps that are conducive to liberation. So let's see what he says. Going on. Nitya Pyasa Jate Praptin Prapti Bhavetasa Chitapanaha Tasma the Brahmanithi Tase Jigyasu Shayase Chiram. Without constant practice, the self, which is of the nature of pure existence, consciousness, bliss, cannot be attained. Therefore, the sincere seekers should always meditate on Brahman for their own good. Yes. So this is what we are to do. So in Pandit Rajmani's commentary on Yoga Sutra, uh, he basically boils it down to abhyasa and vairagya, practice and renunciation. Those are the two things we need to do. Let go of the world. Let go of ideas of self. Stay close to the maxim that if I'm disturbed, no matter the cause, I'm the one with the attachment. I'm the one with the control issue. I'm the one with the expectation. I'm the one with the identification. This does not mean that the world and its people are not oftentimes quite wrong. But if I'm reacting, I have the plesha. I have the affliction. I need to practice vairagya. Then, abhyasa, meditation. Now, not just one practice. Some people will go off to uh, a guru and they'll get a mantra. The, the transcendental meditation people did that. One practice for your whole life. Actually, my particular viewpoint of it is that the yogi needs to have what I call her bag of tricks, her carpet bag of practices. And which practice is efficacious depends on how subtle or gross the mind is. So the rule of thumb is this. The grosser the mind, the more meditative supports we need. The subtler the mind, we let them drop away. If we're highly emotional and completely identified and triggered, self-inquiry may not be the best practice. Antithetically, your mind may be extremely quiet. You may be more quiet than the mantra. So we want to be familiar with some practices and we use what's efficacious depending on how gross or subtle the mind is. Any thoughts on this? So here Shankara sums this up, constant practice, Nididhyasana. Next one. Jim, actually, I do have a thought or a question. Um, Please. What, what's, what do you think of um, 
a kind of meditation where you simply just watch everything that arises. Like today, that's kind of what I, that, that was what I was doing. My mind was very identified, but um, what is, what is your sense of that? I think you should trust your intuition. Mm. As a rule, I invite us not to get caught up in what I call recipes. Right. The guru ultimately is within you. And you will know what you need to do. If you're brutally honest with yourself. And again, the vairagya will inform your abhyasa, your practice. So if underneath you're just simply watching it, you're fundamentally aware this is just a mind state and I'm going to do my best not to get involved with it. Nobody out there is making me feel anything. I'm triggered. It's my problem. Is that making sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, if the mind says, how could he have said that? Why did he do that to me? He's such a jerk. And, oh, uh, what am I going to do about him? Because he made me feel. <laughs> you should have had enough yoga by now to know that that's just your ego trying to protect itself. Right. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Very good question. Very good question. Another yeah. one that I like to use, I have no thoughts or feelings of my own. Mm -hmm. This is just mind going by. Yeah. Yeah. Does not belong to me. It's just stuff going by. Doesn't matter where it comes from. I found that a very useful meditation. Good questions, good questions. Anybody else on this point? All right, next verse. There are two verses together. All right. Yamo hi niyamas tagyago monam deshashtakalataha asanam mulabandhascha dehasamyam cha drish drikstati. Prana san yamanam chaiva pratyaharascha dharana atma dhyanam samadhishcha proktanyangani vekramat. The control of the senses, yama, the control of the mind, niyama, renunciation, dhyaga, silence, Mona, space, desha, time, gala, posture, asana, sucking in the anus, mulabandha, holding steady the body, deha samaya, steadiness of, great, of gaze, drikstiti, control of prana, prana samaya, sorry, prana samyama, Prana samyamana, the withdrawal of the mind, pratyahara, continuous reflection, dharana, contemplation on the self, dhyanam, and total absorption, samadhi. These are indeed the items declared barely in a series. So you can see this is directly drawn from Yoga Sutra. Now he's going to do a little bit of a different take 
on all of these. So some uh, commentators, especially Westerners, have said that, oh, Yoga Sutra fell out of fashion and it's only been rediscovered in the past couple hundred years. This is absolute historical evidence against that. Obviously, Shankara was familiar with the text. So now let's see what he's going to do with all these things. Now, the Mula Bandha here means the whole range of practices. Uh, help me out here. I think it's uh, uh, Rechaka, Kumbhaka, and the Bandhas, the, the inhalations, the exhalations, the movement of energy, and the various blocks. What do you call the one in the throat when you block the breath there? Jalandhar. Yeah. So all of that is implied by this term mulabandha. That's just one of them. Yamas and niyamas, he's going to go into those moral precepts. Um, the withdrawal of the senses. Maunam, silence. Of course, the word muni comes from the same root as mauna. A wise person is one with a silent mind. Dharana, concentration. Jnana here is usually translated as meditation. I think Swamiji translated as contemplation. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately samadhi. So he's going to go into all these. Uh, he's broken them down into 15 legs. Any thoughts on this? Okay, let's go. Next one. Sarvam Brahmoti Vigyana Adinitra Yagrama Sayamaha Yamo Ayamiti Sampro. Sampro Rokta Abhyasani Murmuha. By the direct knowledge that all this is Brahman, to gain a life of easy restraint of all the senses is rightly called Yama. This should be practiced again and again. So in the Yoga Sutra, we have the five Yamas. I can't remember them. Scott, can you list them for us? I think so there's um, uh, harmlessness, truthfulness, non-stealing, non-hoarding, and um, brahmacharya. Okay. Now, he takes those and he kind of completely reorients our mind. So list again or uh, share again with us, uh, Aditi, how he defines it, just the English. By the direct knowledge that all this is Brahman, to gain a life of easy restraint of all the senses is rightly called Yama. Yes. So here what he's saying is direct experience of the self the practice of knowledge gives us the fruit of all these yamas without the external discipline needing to be the cause of it. So it's just a different approach. What is the practice of Brahman? Aham Brahmasmi, I am that heartless Brahman. What is this world? Sarvam Kalvidam Dhamma. It's all Brahman. What is the truth about the names and forms? Brahma Satyam Jagan Nitya. Brahman alone is real. The phenomenal world is illusory. So this is his version. Of Yama. Any thoughts on this? 
Next verse. Sajatiya pravahashta vijatiya tiraskritihi niyamohi parānando niyamati kriyatyate budhe. To maintain a continuous flow of thoughts of the same species by rejecting the influx of all dissimilar thought currents is called niyama, which is a great bliss experience. This is regularly practiced by the wise. So uh, again, help us out here, Scott. What are the niyamas that, that uh, Patanjali lists? Sasha or purity. Um, right. Purity, <clears throat> self-study, um, tapasya, and I can't remember the other two offerings. Austerities. Can anybody else help us out? Do you remember them, Aditi? Contentment. Oh, yes. Tapasya. Yeah. And penance. Do you, uh, do you know the, the, the mall? Um, uh, Susli? No. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. But anyway, the whole point here um, is you can take them on as an external practice. I'm going to practice being content. But what Shankar is saying is go to the cause of the extroversion of the mind. And let's deal with that. So with that in mind, read the English one more time of his definition of niyama. To maintain a continuous flow of thoughts of the same species by rejecting the influx of all dissimilar thought currents is called niyama, which is a so, bliss experience. Yes. So rather than worrying about these five practices, you can pick one thought. So hum, I am that. Shivoham, Shivoham, I am that. And when dissimilar thoughts arise, I'm good, I'm bad, I'm successful, I'm a failure, I screwed up, I did a good job, brush them aside. Of course, the most powerful, I think, is still the practice that. Uh, Ramana Maharshi says, Koham, who am I? To whom did this thought occur to me? Who am I? So simple, so powerful. And the world seems to be attractive or aversive, problematic or non problematic. Brahma Satyam Jagan Mitya. Let it go. So this is the practice he would prescribe rather than these other behavioral kinds of things. My personal viewpoint, if your mind is grosser, I think Patanjali's approach is just fine. The mind is more sattvic. Shankara's is more useful, perhaps. Any thoughts on this? Now, let's understand a little bit of the context of what's going on here. So when Shankara came on the scene, the pure Vedanta had fallen into uh, disuse. Buddhism had been a major force in India since the third century BCE. And ritual was very important. Largely people were involved in Sankhya philosophy. This idea of an individual soul was going to do all these things and get better and go someplace and do something. And of course, yoga. Yogis acquiring powers and things like that. And Shankara wanted to cut 
through all that into the pure Vedanta that's taught in the Upanishads. So one of the things he did was engage in debate with teachers all throughout India. And the custom was if you defeated the other person in debate, then he had to come over to your philosophy. So you find what we call a polemic, an argument in much of Shankara's writings. He will frequently then go through the various schools of philosophy and logically prove why they're untenable. So there's a mild polemic here against yoga. Yoga meaning here what's in the Yoga Sutras. My personal opinion is there's a place for it. Don't worry about whether it's Sankhya philosophy or Advaita philosophy. The practices can be useful. Anybody else have thoughts on this? I experientially, I found that to be true for me too. The yoga practices are useful. And I actually, the way I'm seeing these verses is that he's kind of joining the two, like he's approaching the same idea from a top down level, whereas the yoga sutras approach it from a bottom up and it's like a meeting. Of Very them. well articulated. Yes, you caught the gist of it. Excellent, excellent. Next verse. Yaga prapancharupasya chidatmatvavalokanat Yago hi mahatam pujyo satyo moksha mayo yataha Real renunciation, Thyaga, always so respectfully honored by the noble sages, is the rejection of the illusory universe on realizing that the universe is nothing but the Atman, the pure consciousness. Yes. So the idea of being a Thyagi, a renunciate, or a sannyasi, has always been extolled. When we find those sages who live simply and purely, who have given up the world. Now, let me tell you my direct experience. And this is both among sannyasis in India and among religious and priests in the West. When you come across older practitioners, they tend to divide themselves into two classes. One class is a tyagi, a renunciate, who's doing it out of some moral position <laughs> or some ego notion, look at me, I'm so holy, I've given all this stuff up. They're usually angry and bitter and quite rigid. My old boss, Father Mark, used to say, if some priest has offended you, be mindful that no one enters the priesthood to drive people away from Christ. They might be having a bad day or a bad year or a bad life. And for me, when I've seen this, the root of it, is they haven't gotten the real fruits of Tyaga. Then there are those who are filled with luminosity, who have lives of deep prayer in the West, lives of deep reveling in the self in the East, who are full of joy, 
Who are you to have trouble? And this is what Shankar is saying. That the purpose of Gyagaha is not to become a goody goody. Look at me, I am more renounced than anybody. I am so pure. I never have my lips, touch, my hand touch my lips. I toss my food into my mouth. I am a breatharian. I only eat radish threads three times a week. I am a Dundee Swami. All this nonsense. What is the real renunciation? Renunciation of our illusion and delusion. The one thing to be renounced is the mind itself. Give up the idea of any personal sense of self. Give up the idea of the fundamental, substantive, separate reality of the world of name. All is Maya, all is yours. This is real. Any thoughts on this? All right, next verse. Yato vacho nir nevartante aprapya manasasaha. Yanmonam yoga virgam yam tad pavetas sarvada buddhe. The wise sage should ever remain in that silence, mana, from which mind along with speech returns without comprehending it. And this state of silence within can be attained by meditators or yogis. Yes. So there is nothing more obnoxious than the person who's maintaining maunam out there in public with an extrovert in mind, and they're trying to communicate everything by hand signs and all this kind of business. <laughs> and all they're doing is being a burden to everyone else. That is not mauna. Real mauna means a quiet mind. Real mauna means to know the ineffable silence of your real nature. Now, is it a value to Monitor speech. Yes. But there are all sorts of other ways to do it. I had a friend who was given the assignment. He thought he was very clever and smart and had an opinion on everything. And he was given the assignment Go for a week and don't offer your opinion unless someone asks for it. And he thought that people would be asking his opinion on everything because he was so smart. You know, the week went by and not one person asked his opinion. Very good exercise.
So real mountain is also to see how in the end, how unimportant my opinions are. So we not only quit believing our own mind, we quit believing other people's minds. We let it be. Real silence is to understand the silence of the self. There's all sorts of depths to this idea. When I first met Swamiji, I was just so taken by the profundity of his speech. Then after a while, I could see that it was very repetitive. I could almost tell you what he was going to say before he said it. But I started to tune up and tune into this Shunya It's vast, empty. It's profound sight. In the end, that's the real teacher. Remember a conversation, someone said, Swamiji, I need to talk to you. He says, what is there to talk about? You can talk to me, Miss Any thoughts on this one? If so, let me go. <laughs> He's a drug. Next verse. There are two verses together. Bacho yasma nivartante tadvaktum kena shakrite Prapancho yadi vaktva yaha. So a bishop the vir vivarjitaha. Iti va tabta ve vain monam. Satam sahaja sa young sa youngitam. Gira monam to balanam. Prayuktam Brahma Vidhi Who can describe that self from which words return? If the phenomenal world of plurality were to be described, that too is beyond words. This is another definition of silence, Mona, which is natural to all men of wisdom. The gross silence by restraining speech is prescribed for the ignorant by the teachers of Brahman. So in the beginning, to help us see the stupidity of most of our thoughts, external silence is suggested. But in the end, the thunder of the silence of the self is avyapadesha. That's the word that Godapada uses in Manduki. Upadesha means to talk about stuff, to teach it. 
Upadesha. Avyapadesha. Avyapadesha. It's untalkable. Hmm. He who knows, knows it not. She who knows it not knows unknown or not. His mouth. Next one. Ada Vantecha Matheja Jano Yasmin Vidyate Yene Dun Yene Dum Sakalam Vyaptam Sadesho Vid Jana Smithihi. That state is space. Desha, wherein the universe, Jenna, never is, either in the beginning, or in the middle, or in the end, but which pervades all these. This is the solitary Vijanaha Brahman state. Yes. So, the woman of wisdom understands that space Real space is beyond physical space. There's Akasha, physical space. Then there's Chib Akash, space of consciousness itself, in which the world appears like a dream appears in the night. See, but not be. Know that ground of being. Space of consciousness. This is what it means to really understand space. In Gita, Krishna says, first, I think it's in fourth chapter, all this is strung on me like gems on a thread, money sutra. That's the earliest part of the teaching. Krishna is in everyone and everything. Self in me is the self in all and it's gone. Oh, that's wonderful. But much later he says, well, actually, I am not in them. They are in me. You are not in the dream. Do you incarnate into the dream? No. You are not in the dream. The dream is in you. It just feels like I am the dream body running around in the dream world. And then he goes on to say, well, in truth, you're not really in me. Can we say something that's imagined is real? If I dream I'm being chased by a bear, when I wake up in the morning, I don't roll over and see a bear next to me. Where did the bear go? Gone. It was never really. Don't 
get caught up. hypnotic dream. It says, come believe in me. Let me take your peace. Next verse. Kalanat Salva Putanam Brahmadinam Meshataha Kala Shabdena Nildishto Hyakandananda Deka Advyaha The one non dual indivisible bliss state, Brahman is indicated by the term time, gala, as it conjures up in a twinkling of the eye, all beings from Brahma, creator, downwards. Yes. So time is the interval between two thoughts, between two vrittis. In order for us to perceive the world, to perceive beings, we need to have movement through time, meaning the flow of Slow down the mind and the phony self in the world thin out. Stop the mind and you stop the world. Now, there's a practice here that's of incredible use. If your mind starts to spin, starts to get caught up in kind of thing, here is a very simple technique. Understanding that if you stop the flow of the mind, that nonsense would go away. Bring your mind paradoxically to your senses. Let me show you. Pay attention just to the breath in the body. Now, at the same time, try to also listen to the traffic outside or the outside sounds. Now try to feel your toes, all three of them. stop the mind right away. Nobody's mind can really pay attention to three things at once. Two maybe. But if you bring your attention into direct sensory experience, the mind will stop on a dime. Play with this. Play with it. But if some of us are obsessed with, or afflicted by obsessive thinking, because you have to have the flow of thought through time to make all the craziness of the world show up. My problem. Any thoughts on this? Swamiji used to say a single pointed mind is as good as no mind. If you can be single pointed 
on the mud and stuff. On an activity that you're doing. Time will disappear. Any thoughts on this? Next verse. So can I have this min just from from her chintanam asanam tadvijaniya on neither this is funny. <laughs> that should be understood as the right posture asana in which meditation upon Brahman will flow spontaneously with unbroken, effortless ease. Asana is not any of the posture which destroy one's comfort. So, um, here again, it's not about tying the body into a pretzel. The real asana is that posture of mind and flow towards Brahma. Mm. So what's the value of asana? Asana serves several purposes in my opinion. Some of us are attracted to it at different times of our life than others. The main goal of asana is to free the body from stress and pain that draws our attention to the body when we try to meditate. The second goal is that it works on the nervous system because as energy starts to flow through the nervous system as the result of meditation, some people get lots of discomfort in the body because of it. They shake, rattle, and roll. The asana will help clean out those energy channels. And the third value of asana, can't remember what the, the technical Western term is, where you're able to observe your body in space. Dancers have to have it. Proprioception. Uh, gymnasts have to have it. Do you know what it's called, Aditi? Proprioception. Say it again. Proprioception. Proprioception, yes. Remember that gal, uh, the little tiny gymnast who was having uh, the twitchies or whatever it was called during the Olympics, and she she had to back away because she she her proprioception was off. She would lose awareness of her body in space. Remember that? Yeah. So if you're doing asana. One of the things that you do is you begin to locate your body in space. In order to do the asana correctly, teacher may come around and say, "Okay, your arms are not, you know, where they should be. You know, no, your 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 back, you're leaning to one side. You need to be straight, etc." This act of Conscious proprioception gives us the direct experience of the body as an object of awareness. We can unfold the scripture and say, you are not your body, you are the knower of your body. But doing asana 
gives you the direct experience that you are the observer of the body. If you know that you're leaning to the left rather than straight up and down, how do you know it? You are observing it. Think. So it teaches us to witness the body through our experience. Any thoughts on this? And again, to borrow the language that Adithi said, rather than the bottom up, this goes from the top down. I have no body. I am near Rupaham. I am Videham, beyond. That's the proper awesome. Any thoughts on this? Next first. Sit Sitam Yatsa Sarva Putadi Vishwatishtanam Yayam Yasmin. Yasmin Siddha Samavishta Stadeva Siddha Sanam Pituhu. That which is famously known as the beginning of all beings, that which is the immutable substratum for the entire world of happenings, that in which the men of realization stay merged, that is to be understood as Siddha Asana. So, the Yoga Sutras deal with what we call Siddhis, powers. Swami Tapovanam would say, so you want to levitate, fly through the air? So what, a bird can do that? <laughs> So you want to sit or stand very still on one leg for hours and hours without moving. So what? A tree can do that. You want to be in the ice cold Ganges River up to your neck doing tapas. So what? A stone. <laughs> the woman of realization has the Mahasiddhi. She's at peace. She's free from fear. One of my sometimes students, a young man named John, is a, a, a yoga teacher, teaches uh, asana. And he was reading some book about Himalayan masters who acquire siddhis and they live 400 years and he was thinking oh i'd really like to do that so obvious question for me what happens at year 401 you're dead are you any less dead than the person who died at 85 or 90 no So when we look at our sadhana 
and we think we have momokshutva, the burning desire for liberation. It is important to really examine what it is that we want. Could it be, I want to be just a little better than other people? So I can feel a little superior and I'm okay then. Big one that I came up with is if I'm holy, maybe then they'll love me. Do I want to be a little bit more important? Do I have spiritual ambition? Do I want to be like the saints? Of this attention and power. All of that has to go. No personal sense of self is real. Whether you think you're a worm, a terrible person, a brilliant person, a saintly person, or a person with powers, or a realized. Know that you are brother. The great cosmic joke is you've always been that. And so is everybody else. Any thoughts on this? All right, next verse. Yan mulam sarva bhutanam, yan mulam chitta bandhanam, mula bandha sada sekyo, yogo aso raja yoginam. That supreme, which is the root of all existence, upon which the mind is to stay in contemplation, is termed as sucking in the root. This is to be practiced by Raja Yogins. So Mula Bandha means to have the energy block in the root chakra, the Mula Dhara. But let's look at what the word really means. What is the root of all things? Both in Gita and Katopanishad, we have the uh, great image of the Ashwata tree, whose roots are above and branches are below, meaning the root of everything is in nature. Bandha means to bind something together. So we can say Mulabhanda is the same thing as Nitya Yukta, forever yoked to the world. It's not about sitting on your heel, sticking it up your fanny. <laughs> Now, there's implications in all of this stuff of, of Patanjali about the raising of the Kundalini. Does the Kundalini, Kundalini exist? Yes. And in the relative world, it does. Can you, through pranayama and the various bandhas, raise the Kundalini away from all the various chakras? Yes. In jnana yoga, to use again what Aditi said, it's top down. 
we can say, in a way, we open the crown chakra first. What happens when the crown chakra opens? You have knowledge yourself. Then the knowledge filters down through the equipment. I was reading online something about Osho. You know, uh, Rajneesh, Bhagavan Sri Rajneesh. And he was a philosophy pro professor. I don't know much about who his guru was, if he had one. But the story is after his realization, he was really sick for months. as the knowledge filtered down into his equipment. So again, it's not from the bottom up, it's from the top. That's why we say jnana yoga is the most direct and the fastest but it involves intense vairagya. Any thoughts or questions about this? All right, one more. Anganama samatam vidyas me brahmani liyate no chenneva samat no samanatva nijutvam shushka vikshavat Merging into the homogeneous mass of pure consciousness, Brahman, is known as the holding steady of the body, deha samya. Merely straightening the body and holding it steady as a dried up tree is not poise of the body. Saman, samanatvam. So in meditation, the suggestion is have a posture, uh, padmasana, subhasana, and then your spine straight, the head and the neck and the spine in alignment, and then don't move. If itches come up or stuff like that, the suggestion is observe them, don't. Actually, in the end, you can meditate in any posture. For most of us, it's a value to keep a straight spine. The whole point is you're more able to sit still and not have your attention drawn to the body. You want to be able to forget. But you don't get a gold star for being able to sit immovable for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> the real stillness of posture is the mind. Still by its absorption in the body. Now, practically speaking, should I meditate eight, ten hours a day? 
it can be of great value to go on a retreat and do that for a couple weeks, maybe even a month. But in the end, more than a couple hours a day is not necessary. Swamiji always used to say depth of meditation is far more important than length of meditation. Depth of meditation is more important than length. What about a minimum? For most of us, it takes about 20 minutes for the mind to really settle down. So 20 minutes, I would say, once you're established, is minimum. But 30, 40 minutes a day, an hour, that's fine. But even 10 minutes is better than none at all. If you are not used to sitting on the floor, cross-legged, sit in a chair. If you're young and your body is strong, if you learn to be able to sit in Padmasana, that's the lotus posture, or Sukhasana, that's when your legs are just crossed, you have great liberty, because then you can meditate anywhere. But in the end, the point is to be able to withdraw our attention from the body. If you're slouching, your body's going to hurt after a while. Any thoughts on this? In my basic art of meditation course, when we talk about posture, I say there's a very secret spiritual reason why yogis in India sit cross-legged on the floor. It is because they don't have any chairs. Culturally, up until modern times, chairs were not part of Indian culture. Ate on the floor, you drank tea on the floor, and you meditated on the floor. That's what you did. Unless our bodies are not used to it. So there's no sin in meditating in a chair. Swamiji, whenever we would have a camp around the meditation hall, there would always be chairs. For old people and Westerners, now I qualify on both of those. <laughs> Any thoughts on this? Okay, we'll stop here. Om Pur Namada Pur Namidam Pur Nat Pur Namudachate Pur Nasya Pur Namadaya Pur Namena Vashishate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Sri Guru Pyona Maha Hari Om What verse will we start with next week, Aditi? Um, we will start on 116. We're getting to the end of the text. Yeah. So we may want to think about what we'll do next. Yeah. All right. Thank you all. Thanks for Thank chanting. You, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.